The first scripture this morning is Psalms 90, 12 through 17. The psalmist prays for God's compassion and steadfast love. So teach us to count our days that we may gain a wise heart. Turn, O Lord, how long? Have compassion on your servants. Satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love so that we may be joy, rejoice and be glad all our days. Make us glad as many days as you have afflicted us and as many years as we have seen evil. Let your work be manifest to your servants and your glorious power to their children. Let the favor of the Lord our God be upon us and prosper for us the work of our hands. O oh, prosper the work of our hands. The second scripture this morning is Mark 10:17 through 31. In the gospel reading, Jesus teaches a hard lesson about wealth. As he was sitting out on a journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. You shall not defraud. Honor your father and mother. He said to him, Teacher, I have kept all these since my youth. Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said, You lack one thing. 
Go sell what you own and give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. When he heard this, he was shocked and went away grieving, for he had many possessions. Then Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How hard it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were perplexed at these words. But Jesus said to them again, Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. They were greatly astounded and said to one another, Then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, For mortals it is impossible, but not for God. For God all things are possible. Peter began to say to him, Look, we have left everything and followed you. Jesus said, Truly I tell you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for my sake and for the sake of the good news who will not receive a hundredfold now in this age, houses, brothers and sisters, mothers and children, and fields with persecutions, and in the age to come eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. Do we have what it takes to go all in? The Reverend Dr. Carolyn Scanlon Holmes and Reverend Jerry Zare posed that question in their sermon as guest preachers at a chapel service at Christian Theological Seminary in Indianapolis. During their sermon, they challenged the students there to remember our dedication to the faith and what it means to go all in. To illustrate, the Reverend Jerry Zare shared his experiences as a regular competitor in the World Series of Poker in Las Vegas. Reverend Zare, a player who has found moderate success in that venue, told us how a player cannot expect to advance if he or she is unwilling to go all in. In poker, players place bets based on the strength of their hands, and the one who goes all in has the confidence that his or her hand will beat all other hands at the table, take the pot, possibly eliminating other players, but definitely being eliminated if the confidence in that hand proves misplaced. When players go all in, they place everything they have on the table. In today's scripture, Jesus gives the command for his disciples to go all in. And so I look to today's scripture to learn more about what it means to give and what Jesus means when he says to go all in. In the story, a man asks Jesus what it takes to inherit eternal life. The man has surely heard about Jesus and all that Jesus has done and taught, the way Jesus brings relief to those in need and spreads the message to all those around him. The man must know that Jesus knows a different way from the chaos the man experiences around him. In other words, he wants to know whether he will make it through these dark and difficult times he was going through, both in terms of the afterlife and in terms of his life right then, his life in the midst of the turmoil that was going on around him. In this context, eternal life does not begin when someone dies. Rather, it's a timeline that continues from someone's time while alive that runs through the chaotic situations of life on through death and into eternity. Eternal life not only has implications for the future, but for the man's own life 
in the moment. Finding eternal life in this context means getting on the right track. Now, I believe that God will take care of everyone when we die, no matter what. But that inspiration for eternal life can help people get on track through the difficulties we face in the moment we are in, whatever we are going through. The man knows this, and so he comes to Jesus to ask about it, to see if he can find that way toward eternal life. And Jesus responds in verse 19 by reminding the man about the commandments. Jesus responds to the man's question by quoting the Ten Commandments. So, for Jesus, the secret to eternal life is not that secret. It has been around for many generations and recorded in his people's history and recorded in the commandments of the Bible. For Jesus, then, eternal life extends not only forward through the chaos, but backward through the traditions and the message of the faith. These traditions and message have brought the people through so much this far and can continue to bring the people through trials and tribulations in the future. The man hears this and he answers Jesus in verse 20. Teacher, I have kept all these commandments since my youth. The man wants eternal life. And the man is on the right track. But somehow inside he still feels that something is missing. That that Jesus knows something that can get him closer to that right track. And Jesus senses this. And Jesus wants the man to go all in. In verse 21, Jesus sees the man, loves him, and tells him, You lack one thing. Go, sell what you own, and give the money to the poor. And you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. That seems pretty extreme to me. It seems harsh. This man genuinely wanted to be a part of what Jesus stood for, a community of inclusion and lifting people up, and he was on the right track to do so. He followed the commandments. He did not lead a life of greed or of exploitation or of abuse of power. He lived a life of justice according to those commandments. In fact, I imagine that because he knew God's commands, he knew how to use his resources in ways that made things happen in his community. With his resources, I imagine that he was able to get things done, assisting those in need and promoting the message of his faith to those around him. The man's positions put him in a position to make a difference. So it shocks him when Jesus wants him to give all of that up. The man leaves grieving, for he has many possessions, unable to get from Jesus the one thing he sought. Jesus' statements not only shock that man, They shock his disciples who have been around Jesus for so long and heard Jesus' message of inclusion for so long and knew Jesus so intimately. So Jesus makes it clear what he means. Children, he says, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich 
to enter the kingdom of God. Is Jesus putting up barriers? In impossibly small passageways to keep people out of the kingdom of God? The kingdom of God is the community of people who are all on track for eternal life. And Jesus says that people with wealth, people with the means to make a difference, are, are the ones who do not fit in, uh, just as a camel does not fit through the eye of a needle. If this guy who is on the right track, who can make things happen and get stuff done, can't make it, then who can? The disciples ask this very question. Then who can be saved, they ask in verse 26. Saved is yet another way of talking about being a part of the kingdom of God, this path toward eternal life. Then who can be saved? In their minds, with that statement Jesus just said, this might as well be impossible. And Jesus then confirms it. In verse 27, he says, it is impossible. For mortals, it is impossible. But then he says, for mortals it is impossible, but not for God. For God, all things are possible. People enter the kingdom of God, that community who seeks to live by the guidance of eternal life, not from the hard work or their ability to make things happen, but from God's own work working in their lives. The man with his wealth had the power to make things happen, and Jesus asks him to give up that power. God's kingdom belongs not to the powerful, but to those whose power comes from their reliance on God. In verse 28, Peter notes how he and the other disciples, in their long journey with Jesus, have left everything to be on that journey. So Jesus responds in verse 29, saying, Truly I tell you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for my sake and for the sake of the good news who will not receive a hundredfold now in this age houses, brothers and sisters, mothers and children and fields with persecutions in this age and in the age to come, eternal life. The disciples are also on the right track. They have given up everything, and they have gained even more. They have found the kingdom both for this life and the promise that it will continue for eternal life. Now, I have a few observations about exactly what they've given and what they've gained. First, the disciples aren't giving wealth in order to receive more wealth, as some televangelists might claim. They don't actually get back a hundredfold of what they give. In fact, when they give up their possessions, they stay without those possessions. When Jesus says that they get, receive a hundredfold of houses, brothers and sisters, mothers and children, and fields, he refers to the family that they have in the community of all who are following Jesus, all who are seeking that kingdom of God. Followers gain brothers and sisters in the family of faith, and in that family of faith they have access to all that is provided. 
Next, when Jesus says that the disciples leave mothers and fathers, they don't dismiss their mothers and fathers in exchange for the community. In fact, in verse 19, when Jesus cites the Ten Commandments, Jesus specifically cites the commandments, honor your father and mother. Further, reading through the book of Mark, I find that Peter stays close with his family, caring for his mother-in-law, accompanying Jesus with his brother Andrew, and even offering his family's house as a home base for Jesus in Capernaum. Peter doesn't get rid of his family and home. Instead, he sees what happens when God works in those relationships and when God makes use of those possessions. Peter isn't using them for his own purposes alone, but seeing where God takes him with all that he has. Finally, Jesus lists persecutions as a benefit that the disciples will receive. Disciples can expect hardship as a result of following, but they can manage this hardship knowing that they are on track to get through the chaos and to get to eternal life. Now, as I look at how I use my resources, I wonder what it looks like when I give it all up. Not selling everything, but just when I let God use the resources rather than myself. And this isn't easy. This isn't something I do automatically or on a regular basis. It takes thinking about it, and it takes discipline. It is hard. But I remember that Jesus says it is not only hard, it is impossible. But we are not here to do the impossible, because with God, all things are possible. We are here to place our reliance and trust in God, to see what God can do with what we have, whether it is great or whether it is little. After all, this is what stewardship means, recognizing that God is the owner and that we are stewards, taking care of what already belongs to God. Our stewardship campaign this year encourages the joy of generosity. In giving, we receive. During stewardship, we encourage giving to the church, but we do not give because we hope that those resources will make a difference, although they do make a difference. We give because it helps us remember what God does to make that difference. This goes for our personal funds as well as for the budget that the entire church is making with our pledges. It is not what we can do, but it's about the amazing things that can happen when we allow God to have access to what we have. When I think of that theme, the joy of generosity, I think of the many churches I have worked with in impoverished areas. And it strikes me how in so many of those churches, one of the most joyous times of the worship service is the collection. People come up to the trays singing and giving their money and putting it in the trays. Joyous not because of the huge difference their contribution will make, but because they can see how God is able to do something with what they do give and how they belong to something greater than they could do with just their funds alone. 
At South Street, we celebrate the joy of generosity. We celebrate the joy that we give and we celebrate the joy in how those funds work in our community, work with the Supper Club, work with the Grant Beach Ministries, work with our education programs. We take joy in what we give. We bring what we can to the table and we see what God can do with it. When we're playing a game with God and we put all our chips on the table, we always lose. God always wins. And God takes what we bring to the table and uses it for God's kingdom. God uses it for eternal life. God gives us the encouragement to go all in.